What a huge star I really was when I played. <laughs> okay, that part's not true. But my timing was good. I got to win two Stanley Cups with the Broad Street Bullies. And I dare say my timing was, thank you. I, I dare say my timing was far better as a player than it was when I retired. I got into the restaurant franchising business and I was going to attack the world. I put all of my money into the venture, a lot of other people's money into the venture. And two and a half years after I retired at age 35, I lost it all. I filed corporate and personal bankruptcy. I lost my home, my marriage dissolved. I had no job, I had no career, I had no training, I did not have a college degree. And after a few bouts of getting into the shower at six in the morning and starting to cry and getting out soaking wet, going back into bed, covering up and being asleep in 30 seconds, after a few of those episodes, I said, now is the time I'd better figure out how this success thing works. So I started studying successful organizations. I thought, wow, I played on two Stanley Cup teams. I should know something about it. And it became obvious very soon that successful organizations had an abundance of people that I started calling everyday leaders. Everyday leaders are people that they don't bother waiting for the job title or the C for captain on their chest before they start influencing people. And they understand that regardless of our job titles, we all sit in this powerful seat of influence. We can influence people's moods and their attitudes and their behaviors and their contributions in the workplace, how much they're willing to sacrifice and dedicate to a group endeavor. I really think that nature, by virtue of the fact that we were all born, puts us at the starting line. But everyday leaders make choices that not only ramp them up this curve of success, but that really put them in this powerful seat of influence. One of the choices that everyday leaders make is they choose to be givers. And I always thought you could put people in one of two categories. You can either be a giver or a taker. Takers say, what's in this for me? And givers say, what can I do to help? What can I do to improve the quality of life of that person sitting next to me or maybe that person over there? Maybe there's somebody that I don't even know. What can I do to improve their quality of life? And I think the ultimate act of giving is when we are truly willing to sacrifice our individual goals, safety or security for a principle or an ideal that we know will benefit the group even if we put ourselves in harm's way. And I learned so much about this from the man that was behind the bench when we won our two Stanley Cups. His name was Fred Shiro. We called him Freddy. The media called him The Fog. They, they thought he was in a fog. He wasn't in a fog. He was just a very shy man. Freddie was diminutive. He was a tiny little wiry guy, and he wore these big old glasses. And if anybody ever tried to take advantage of him physically, they made a big mistake. They didn't know that Freddie had been offered a contract when he got out of the Canadian Navy to turn pro as a boxer. We had a problem the first year we marched to the Stanley Cup final when we met the Boston Bruins. And here was the problem. We hadn't won a game in Boston in seven years, and we did not have home ice advantage in this seven-game series, so we had to win a game in Boston. Game one was proceeding on course. We went into the last minute tied, and we were willing to accept sudden death overtime. We'll take one shot in overtime, we'll win game one, and then we'll win the Stanley Cup. So we go into the final minute tied. With 22 seconds to go in game one, the puck was shot deep into our corner, and our big lumbering defenseman, Andre Mousse Dupont, went lumbering back into the corner to get the puck. And right on his back was a Bruins winger named Ken Hodge. As they got to the corner, Ken Hodge put his arms around Moose, fell down to the ice, and tackled him. There was no penalty called. I mean, he put his arms around him and tackled him. And there, not that that still bothers me. Behind Ken Hodge was Wayne Cashman. He was the third guy, and he grabbed the puck, and who was coming down the middle of the ice, completely unmarked, the great Bobby Orr. Bang, Cashman taped the tape pass to Bobby Orr, and he blistered one by our Hall of Fame goalie, Bernie Perrant, and the Bruins won game one with 22 seconds to go. So we all went back to our hotel. We're getting a bite to eat, and we were staying out of town. We were in a private room, and Freddie was there with us, and Freddie said, okay, guys, listen up. Here's your choice. He said, tomorrow, I'm going to give you the choice of going down to Boston Garden and practicing for an hour and a half, 
Or you can each play nine holes of golf and turn your scorecards into me. He always said things like that, turn your scorecards into me. We said, what's the difference with that? (laughs) We voted to golf. (laughs) And we golfed. But I mean, what coach in his right mind in a major league championship would let his guys golf the day before the game? The next night, game two, right after we golfed, we're down by a goal going into the last minute. And poetic justice was served as Moose DuPont launched a shot from the blue line that had eyes. It found its way through a maze of players into the back of the net. We tied the game and we won game two early in the first overtime period. We went on to win the Stanley Cup in six games. And you know, it wasn't until years later that I started reflecting on the chance that Fred Shiro had taken with his career. I mean, what would have happened had we gotten blown out 9-0 in game two and lost the Stanley Cup final? Would his career have ended? Probably not. Would he have been criticized and vilified by everybody? Absolutely. Freddie passed away in 1990 of lung cancer, and he was sick for a few years before that. And I went to see him one day. We chatted about all kinds of things, but there was this question I needed to ask him. At one point, I said, Freddie, you've got to tell me, what in the world were you thinking when you let us golf on that off day? Weren't you afraid of, of what could happen to your career? Weren't you afraid if we lost an eight or nine nothing? He said, you know what? I was. He said, leading up to it, I was terrified. But he said, I knew you guys were in shape. You knew how to pass, shoot, score, everything. The advantage we had over the Boston Bruins was the bond that you all shared. I knew that was what made us better. I'd never been around a team as closely knit as you guys. And I wanted to nurture that bond and let you be together and let you smile and laugh and really experience one another one more time. Loyalty, putting yourself in harm's way, and the bond. I try to tell audiences all the time, if you focus on the bond as much as you do the bottom line in the corporate world, believe it or not, the bottom line somehow finds a way of taking care of itself. Another choice that everyday leaders make, they choose to confront their fears, even if it's the tough conversation. And we've all been afraid of something or someone in our lives, haven't we? Absolutely. And there's a difference between being afraid and being nervous. I used to thrive on being nervous. I needed that adrenaline before I played. And I was definitely nervous going into my second year as a pro. I was nervous because I had to negotiate a contract. My dad helped me with my first one. I was 19 when I turned pro and dad did the heavy lifting. But by this time I was 20. (laughs) I didn't need daddy anymore. And I knew who my adversary was going to be. It was going to be the great Hall of Fame general manager, Keith Allen. His nickname was Keith the Thief. <laughs> that should have been my first clue, right? <laughs> Keith Allen was, was so charismatic. And his nickname, Keith the Thief, came because he literally could get a good player in return for a bag of used pucks. <laughs> he was that good. And he was so charismatic. He had a baritone voice. If everybody here in the room were speaking at the same time, you could always hear Keith's voice piercing through, square jaw, always tan, well-dressed. And I would look at him some days, and I could swear that the part in his hair was surgically implanted. (laughs) But it didn't matter. He was going down, because I knew how to negotiate. I would start high. He would start low. We'd wrestle around a little bit, and we'd come to some kind of agreement in the middle somewhere. I knew that's how negotiations went. Now this first year of pro, I played in the minors. Flyers drafted me as a 19-year-old. I was good defensively. They wanted me to become better offensively. So they put me in the minors, and I led the team in scoring. So I was entitled to a raise, a big raise. And that first year, I had a two-way contract, which means I had an an American League salary in the minors. It was $9,500. Had I been called up to Philadelphia that year, there would have been a giant upward modification of my salary all the way to $12,500. I was never called up, so I made $9,500 that year. I felt I I felt I was entitled to a big raise. I was going to ask for $16,500 in the minors and $22,500 in the NHL. Three days before camp broke, I was summoned to Keith's office. There I was in front of his office, rehearsing mentally. I knew he'd be sitting in there. Knocked at the door. He said, come in. 
I sat down. He was writing on a yellow legal pad with a number two pencil, yellow pencil with an eraser, and he put his head down and he proceeded to write for what I thought was 40 minutes. <laughs> it was probably 30 seconds. Finally, he looked up at me and said, what do you want? And I said, I'd like 16.5 for the minors and 22.5 for the NHL. And his eyes started to grow. They got bigger and bigger and bigger, and he threw his pencil up off the ceiling, and it came crashing down on the desk, and he screamed at me, you want what? He said, you want what? He said, there's you and a couple of other guys on this team that think you are worth the moon and the stars. You know what? I'm not even going to negotiate with you. I'm going to send you immediately to arbitration. Get out. <laughs> so I, I got up. I went out. I closed the door behind me, and I stood there thinking, that went pretty well. <laughs> I didn't even know what arbitration meant. The next night I was called up to his hotel room and I walked in, there was a little table there and he said, there's your contract, take it or leave it, that's all I'm gonna do. I walked over, I looked at the contract, it was 12-5 for the minors and 16-5 for the NHL. And I said, all right, this is your opportunity, you can either be a man or a mouse. I picked up the pen, I looked at Keith Allen where he was sitting, and I, I bent over and I signed the contract. <laughs> And I walked out of his room going, squeak, 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 squeak. <laughs> Everyday leaders confront their fears. Everyday leaders also help those around them feel vital. I learned about this from our great captain, Bobby Clark. I didn't play those first two games in Boston in that series. I was in a cast from my groin to my ankle. I had a badly torn ligament in my knee. I got the cast taken off and the doctor said, I'm doing this against my better judgment. I said, I want to try and play. When we got home from Boston, I want to see if I can play. I couldn't even skate. Even up to game four, I was just in the whirlpool trying to get some flexibility back in my leg. I couldn't bend it to 90 degrees. And our captain, Bobby Clark, came in and he sat down beside the whirlpool before game four. And he said, how is it? And I said, Clarky, it's not good at all. He said, you need to know something. I don't think we can win the Stanley Cup without you. I said, really? He said, look, we've got three other guys that have injuries that are worse than yours. The guys from the minors can't do what you can do. He said, even if you could suit up and just kill penalties, it would really help us. But I don't want you to do anything to jeopardize your knee, jeopardize your career. People said, you know, that's peer pressure. I said, no, he didn't use sarcasm, didn't raise his voice, didn't threaten me. He made me feel that I was vital to the outcome. I got out of the whirlpool and got the trainer to tape me up and I went and took the warm up and I could swear that I had two neon signs on me. One across my back that read one-legged man <laughs> and one pulsating on and off here that said, hit him here, hit him here, hit him here. <laughs> I came back out of the warm up, up to our locker room. The trainer said, can you play? And my brain screamed at him, not a chance. And my lips went, yes. I played game four, game five, and game six, and I've had people tell me that they thought I was one of the best players on the ice in game six, and the story is not about how well I played. I don't think I would have been in the lineup had I not been made to feel that I was vital to the outcome. Here's a challenge for all of you. When you go back to your places of business, your families, try and pick somebody that doesn't get a lot of attaboys and let them know that you can't do what you do without them and that they're a very important part of your team. Do you know, as humans, we're not at our best when we're perched at the summit. We're not. We're climbers. We're at our best when the way is steep. Nature puts us all at the starting line. But we all have the ability to make choices that can help us not only climb any mountain that we choose, but end up perched at the summit. I know you can. I got a feeling you will. And I just want to wish you good luck in getting there. Thank you.